couple of months ago, I got a good lesson on just how silly it is for people from my generation to try to teach students today, whether college or even elementary or secondary students, how to do anything on the internet or on computers. This happened about three months ago. My wife called me at work and asked me if I could come home a little bit early because my daughter, Clarissa, who's nine years old and was in third grade at the time, had been assigned a PowerPoint presentation. So I checked out at about 4.30 and I drove home and I was excited to help my daughter with a project that I had something to offer on. So we came down into my uh, downstairs office at our home and I turned on the PowerPoint and I said, okay, Clarissa, let me show you how you make a PowerPoint presentation. And she just looked at me with angry eyes and said, Daddy, I'm nine. I can do PowerPoint. And so I went, went somewhere else and let her do the PowerPoint and it was probably better than anything I'd ever made. Uh, this is the, the generations that for the last 10 to 15 years have been coming through our elementary and high schools that are now in college. Uh, digital natives, somebody has called them. Possibly you. Uh, people who grew up with PowerPoint and Word and Excel and the web and Facebook and Twitter and all of these things and who use them naturally the way that some of us use language. And that's a good thing. That means you have a head start. But it can also be a bad thing. Because these are all things that have a lot of business uses, as well as a lot of social uses. And not understanding the difference between what's appropriate in a business context and what's appropriate in a social context can get people in trouble. And because there really isn't the solid distinction between a business Facebook page and a social Facebook page, People are often getting into trouble because of what they thought was done with their friends on their own time. What I'd like you to do for a minute uh, is either now or at the end of this podcast, go to Google, type in Fired Over Facebook, and just read some of the stories. I'd like to introduce you to a short little video that I cobbled together that will introduce you to some of these people who have been fired over Facebook, fired for not understanding the professional consequences of their personal behavior on the internet. Drew Stith has worked for Living Essentials for more than a year, until he says a post he made on Facebook ended his job. It was because there was a Facebook page called Five Hour Energy Sucks, and so I liked that page. Um, I don't really like the product that they make. I mean, it doesn't work for me. But Stith did like his job. He said even his good work record couldn't have saved him. They said if I don't like their product and I work there, that that makes their company look bad. Mary Souza worked for American Medical Response, an ambulance company. Someone complained about her work. Officials say the company denied her a union rep. So she went home and complained about her supervisor on Facebook, prompting a lot of other complaints from coworkers. Then the company fired her. Paramedic Richard Doherty got a termination letter from the department's chief yesterday telling him you are hereby ordered not to enter onto the premises of any born fire station. Doherty's job troubles are over his postings on Facebook, some made while on the job containing obscene language unsuitable for air. In one posting, he vented his anger over having to work on July 4th, stuck at expletive mandatory. On top of that, I got to put up with expletives who love this town and are involved in this expletive politically motivated parade. Former Beaufort City Schools bus driver Michelle Threlkel was floored when she lost her job after eight years. The wife and mother of two believes she was targeted after posting an article on her Facebook page that talked about the school district spending $600,000 to install artificial turf on the high school's football and band fields. Threlkel wrote the words, today's humor, next to the posting. The next day, she says the superintendent and others called her on the carpet. He was very upset and angry about my post. Um, told me that I had humiliated him as well as the administration and told me that I had put a huge target on my back. Then, two months later, Ms. Threlkel says on the last day of school she received this termination letter, which simply states we no longer have a position for you. But had you any idea that any of the things that you were saying 
could have been viewed by anyone else other than the people that you thought were your friends on Facebook? No, I had my privacy settings set. And um, I know that that's the case because of a conversation that my students had about, gee, Dr. Seipel has a face space. That's great. Let's go look at it. And another student say, no, you can't. It's all blocked out. Right. And um, Facebook made changes to their uh, privacy policy. Mm -hmm. And I just recently looked up to see how that could have happened. And it's, it turns out when they made that, they default things to being open. Right. If you want to know how people read writing on the internet, just think of how you do. Most of us don't read what's on the computer screen. We skim it. If it's really important, perhaps we print it off, but most of us skim hundreds of web pages a day, taking in just the headlines, the bulleted points, the, the basic gist of what we see, without ever reading in great depth any of these pages. Be aware of this when you write for the internet. Use some of the business basics that you've already learned. Be clear, be concise, be complete, and be conversational. Don't write in a way that's alienating or in a way that's going to make people look things up or that refers to things that they're not aware of. At the same time, though, because you're being skimmed, you've got to make your sentences shorter, your paragraphs shorter, and you've got to use all of the design elements that you don't usually use when you're writing printed text. Titles and headings and bullets and graphics and arrows and all of the things that make the Internet what it is, rather than simply another version of printed texts. A lot of times, people who are designing web pages for the first time try to throw everything that the web offers in all at once, with hundreds of links and lots of pictures and videos and sound files, and you've got to avoid this, because that makes your web page very hard to read. A couple of things you want to realize when you're writing a web page or, or something that is going to appear in the HTML format, um, every link that you have is going to take readers somewhere else. So if you just have a lot of links or a page of links, they're not going to stay on your site for very long. If you have a lot of graphics or video files or sound files, that's going to take a lot longer to load, especially for people who have slower connections. Everybody in the world has a different connection speed, and just about everybody in the world has a different monitor size. So this is a third thing to be aware of. Just because something looks good on your monitor doesn't mean it's going to look good on every monitor. So test your design with various people. Have people who have different kinds of computers and who use different browsers. Uh, Mac users who use Safari or people who use Chrome or Internet Explorer and people who have kind of rectangular monitors and people who have more square monitors. That aspect ratio can wreak havoc with what you're doing. And make sure that your page is easy to load and that it looks good in a variety of different formats. Don't don't put a whole lot of stuff to load first. If you have the video files or the audio files, make those things people can choose to click on and link to. If you make them load with the page, you'll slow up the loading of the page and people will never get to what you have to say. Finally, uh, one of the things you have to be aware of, especially if you're working for a public company, a, a community, or a state government, or the federal government, is that any images that you have on the page have to be labeled in the background. And there are ways you can do that with various tags so that people who are uh, unable to see them, people who are visually impaired, can at least have the images described to them using the kinds of software that, that they use uh, in order to uh, orally describe what's on a web page. So in order to make your web page fully compliant with the Americans for Disabilities Act, you have to describe every image or every video that you use. Social networking is the new it word in business right now. Companies and schools and stores and music groups and movie producers are all trying to figure out how to use Facebook and Twitter to sell their product. And as a result, you've probably, as you've used some of these social network sites, seen them getting more and more commercial, more and more ad intensive, and more and more of the, of the tweets and the Facebook updates that you see are trying to sell you something or at least get you interested in something. Uh, what this means, as we've already said, is that the distance between your social world and your professional world online is collapsing. 
there no longer is that distinction. So always remember that anything you say in any internet venue could become part of your professional life and act accordingly. You must be professional when you are on the internet for business, but you must also be professional when you are on the internet with your own friends, with social activities. This happens every day. I've dealt with three or four issues every year that I've been at Newman University involving people's private Facebook or Twitter accounts. And as you've already seen, people regularly are being fired for things that they thought were private. So always remember that you are a professional and you are a professional in every context. And there are ways that anything you say online can become public knowledge and known to your employee, your clients, your employers, your bosses, your supervisors. Be aware whenever you're on the internet, anything you say, anything you write, can and very well might become public information. Just one word about blogging, which is one of the great pastimes of the digital age. Uh, blogging can be a very useful tool for selling or promoting things or for establishing business connections, but not if all you do is try to sell things or promote things or establish business connections. Blogging is a real commitment. I've maintained a blog since August of last year, 2010, and it's a blog that I use to promote a book that I'm writing and to try to generate potential sales for that book, and I promote it through Facebook, and I promote it through Twitter, and I drive traffic to it, and it's a real chore to have to write something pretty regularly. I try to at least post a new blog post once a week in order to keep people interested. And I just can't talk about how remarkable I am and how I want them to buy my book. The blog has to offer some value to the person who's reading it beyond the value of doing something that's going to be good for me. So with blogging, remember, as with all other social media, that even if you think it's personal, you do not want to write anything that you do not want to become part of your professional life and your professional record. But also realize that unlike Facebook and Twitter, once you set up a blog site and start getting subscribers, you have some responsibility to continue putting interesting or informative or useful or valuable things on that blog site so that the people that you're trying to reach remain uh, attracted to and subscribe to your blog. Okay, let me tell you a, a story about why you are taking this class this semester the way that you're taking this class this semester. Through podcasts, through iTunes University, through brief 10 or so minute, 10 to 15 minute uh, video clips combined with PowerPoint. This isn't how we used to do online education at Newman University. We used another product called iSpring, which worked fairly well, but which only delivered lectures of about... 50 minutes and which um, which had a lot of bugs that we weren't able to fix. So uh, the computer people came to me and said we would like to use iTunes University, we would like to buy Macintosh computers, and we would like to start doing courses as podcasts. At the time I had never heard of a podcast. <clears throat> I didn't know how to do one uh, and I have to admit I didn't see exactly how they could be useful. But what I did know was that we needed to do something different with how we delivered distance education at Newman University. I knew that more and more students were getting their internet on their phones, iPhones and iPads and Android phones. I knew that the 50-minute lectures we were putting up, the video streaming lectures, were overburdening our server and they were making it harder and harder to, to push out to students because they were, they were starting to lock up our server. So we had to do something different. Um, as we talked about what we had to do, it became clear to me that the podcast was worth trying. And that's the, that's the way that this course uh, got born. And you're part of the experiment to see if this is something that we're going to want to pursue at Newman University. What I want to make sure, though, that you don't do in your interactions with technology as you go into the business world, the world of work, is start with the technology and say, gee, podcasts are cool. Let's figure out how to use podcasts. Instead of doing that, start with where you want to go, and you will find the technology that will take you there.